Hello, welcome to another IVF Worldwide and IFFP webinar. Today, we're have very happy to welcome Professor Mary Madeline Doman from Brazil. She is the director of the Gynecological Research Lab, starting from 2012 after Professor Jack Donnie. She herself is also a clinician and practice both as a clinician and a researcher. She has obviously, you know, contribution much to literature. She has published many papers, and she is also the president of the ISFP Society, or president-elect, but will be president come the next general meeting. I'm Newton Leung, I'm introducing you from Hong Kong, and here I think we should just start the webinar because we're a little bit late. So I would like to welcome Professor Marie Madeleine Doman to start her presentation, Fertility Preservation in Women. Where are we in 2020? Thank Professor you, Mr. for this introduction. So I am really glad to see you all today. Indeed, COVID-19 times are not easy. We are missing our families, missing our friends and colleagues. So some people have the feeling of being alone. Some other might feel overwhelmed trying to work with the kids at home. But Professor Zev Shoham and Professor Milton Leon gave us the, the opportunity, in fact, to be together and to share science. And also, as it is said on the ISFP website, fertility preservation is still considered as an emergency and can still be offered to our patients even in these more difficult times. So I think that the webinar of today is uh, quite up to date. And uh, it is my pleasure to present you fertility preservation in women where are we in 2020? So fertility preservation is considered a new discipline in reproductive medicine, and it started back in 1996 for cancer patients. You can see here on that slide from Fertility Sterility from the team of uh, Pelisser, published 2018, that more and more new patients arrive at the IVF unit for fertility preservation, being it for oocyte vitrification or ovarian tissue cryopreservation. And you see that each year more patients arrive to seek for uh, that new technique. So going back to the ovarian reserve in women, we all know that uh, there is a uh, specific amount of primordial follicle according to each patient which is there at the beginning of her life, going down during all the time and uh, being almost zero when the patient is menopause. But when a patient has cancer and need to undergo chemotherapy or radiotherapy, she can have premature ovarian failure. And there we are with the topic of today. Indeed, there are some factors that are gonadotoxic, of course, patients age, we know that, but especially in our situation, chemotherapy like busulfan or cyclophosphamide from the alkylating agent group and radiotherapy are really gonadotoxic. So if there is that gonadotoxicity from this uh, cancer treatment, the risk of infertility after this treatment has been classified by Wallace. And you see that in the high risk column, we found total body irradiation, pelvic irradiation, bone marrow transplantation, and Hodgkin's lymphoma treated by alkylating agents. So if there is that risk of infertility for these patients needing to undergo that treatment, what can we offer? Um, so here we will see to which patient we want to offer fertility preservation. So there are three big categories, malignant disease, benign disease, and maybe social reason for fertility preservation. So in the malignant disease group, you see here that the most frequent indication to preserve fertility 
is hematological malignancies representing 44% in our department with Hodgkin lymphoma representing 22% and then leukemia and non-Hodgkin lymphoma another 11% each. The second most frequent indication is here in blue is breast cancer uh, disease. Of course, then you have other sarcomas and uh, colorectal cancer, for instance. The second class of indication for fertility preservation is benign disease. Of course, women needing to undergo orthorectomy, so this is castrating surgery, but also patients at risk of premature menopause, like Turner syndrome, recurrent ovarian endometriosis, a family history of premature ovarian failure. These are good indications for fertility preservation. And then in these benign disease, we have some patients who still need to have bone marrow transplantation with uh, radiotherapy and uh, uh, chemotherapy, like uh, benign hematological disease and uh, some autoimmune disease unresponsive to medical treatments. And last but not least, nowadays in these modern times, the social reasons. In fact, what we call social reason is more age-related fertility decline due to personal reason of delaying the childbearing wish, which we can understand when you see the life expectancy. If you just Google life expectancy in the United States and you compare the one of the 90s, you see that the women could live until her 48 years of age. And when you check 1998, she can live until her, her 80s. So all this life expectancy is changing the way women behave. So there is that risk of infertility. It is really present. What can we offer to our patients? We will today go together through uh, all these possibilities, starting with the left part of uh, the slide. And I will just say one slide about medical therapy. Indeed, GenRH agonist, still controversial, but it's a whole chapter, which I will not have time to go into details today. But that chapter will be, um, will, uh, will be discussed in a view and review in a Fertile Battle, in Fertility Sterility, probably this year. But just to give you one slide, you know that there was a, a big paper in the New England Journal read by many oncologists in 2015, and the title was Gosserelin for Vine Protection During Breast Cancer Adjuvant Chemotherapy. And you see that the author's conclusion is, although missing data weaken interpretation of the findings, so if the authors themselves acknowledge this, you, you know how what, what to think about it. And especially then, they write, administration of gosserelin with chemo appeared to protect against ovarian failure. Well, we need to keep in mind that if we want to protect the ovaries, in fact, we really want to protect the capability of a patient to be pregnant. And if authors take into account only return of menses, well, might be a bias for uh, what we are looking for for our patients. So let's go on to mature oocytes with uh, IVF and embryo freezing or vitrification of oocytes. Indeed, these are the three big options we can propose to our patients to preserve fertility, embryo, oocyte, and we will end with ovarian tissue. So going back to an old paper published in Fertility Sterility 2005, um, one of what, my first one, well, you see here a series of 11 patients. And you see that four of these received already chemotherapy before IVF. These patients had non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and you see here three leukemias, uh, in which usually the oncologists do not wait to start chemo. So they had some regimens of chemo before being sent to the IVF department by the hematologist. And you see that the number of embryos we could cryopreserve for these four patients who had already received chemo was one, 
for the first one and then 000. All the other ones were sent to cryopreserve embryos before the start of chemo and there we could freeze between 4 and 11 embryos per patient. So clearly there is a problem of number if um, you cryopreserve embryos after the start of chemo. Another problem is the problem of quality of these oocytes, of these embryos. You see here uh, a nice study from Merov going back to 2011. And um, you see here the time in weeks between the cyclophosphamide exposure and the mating. This is in mice, of course. And you see that if uh, the mice mate three weeks after the cyclophosphamide, well, the percentage of malformations in the pups is really, really high. So to conclude, for embryo cryopreservation, of course, we know that there is a need for stimulated cycle and IVF. So there is a need for a partner. Harvesting of viable embryos cannot be guaranteed. And it is not recommended to try to freeze embryos after chemotherapy is already initiated. And another more ethical point is that cryopreserved embryos are the joint property of the woman and her male partner, of course. So this last sentence is an introduction to the next option, which is oocyte vitrification. Of course, speaking about oocyte, uh, you still need that uh, delay, approximately two weeks, to stimulate uh, the patient, and it can be applicable for malignant disease in which we can have that delay and is very good for benign disease in which we are not in a hurry to start chemo and age-related fertility decline. Speaking about that, um, mature or site cryopreservation, well, for cancer patients, specific uh, controlled ovarian stimulation protocols are needed, especially for breast cancer women. We need to try not to delay the onset of the chemotherapy. Good quality oocytes cannot be guaranteed. And same as for embryos, it is not recommended after chemotherapy is initiated. When we speak about mature oocyte uh, vitrification, of course, we need to cite uh, Kobo's article from Pelisser team, like this one. Is vitrification of oocytes useful? for fertility preservation, for age-related fertility decline, and in cancer patients. And then you see here 2016, oocyte vitrification as an efficient option for elective fertility preservation. So let's have a look more deeply in um, the results of that paper. You see here the cumulative live birth rate according to age in blue, the young patients, less than 35, and in green, the older patients, more than 36. And you have here the number of consumed oocytes. So let's take eight oocytes that are consumed. You see that the cumulative live birth rate in the less than 35-year-old women is 40%. And with the same number of oocytes vitrified, in a women more than 36 years of age, you have half of that cumulative life birth rate as it is 20%. And of course, we have there a plateau because you know that obtaining 20 oocytes in an, uh, more than 36 year old women is something very challenging. The, the group of uh, Anacobo went even uh, further and more recently in December, 2018, you can read the nice paper about the outcomes of elective and oncofertility preservation. So uh, these results are summarized in, um, in this slide. Again, you have the cumulative life birth rate and the number of oocytes utilized in these two groups, elective fertility preservation and oncofertility preservation. Again, the young patients in blue and the older patients in green. And we can see, let's take the young patients uh, in blue with 10 oocytes. We have the 42% of cumulative life birth rate 
and in the onco group also 42 percent so might be quite similar with one big difference is that you see that here we can go up and up in young patients who can freeze more ore sites due to the possibility to undergo more cycles but we all know that in uh, onco patients well they have time for only one stimulation so it becomes more, very rare to have more than 10 ore sites in that onco fertility group that is why we have that plateau here and um, that you don't see in the elective fertility preservation group so going on to ovarian tissue cryopreservation we all know that there is no need for partner or sperm donor no but need for surgery in that group the um i will show you here maybe indeed the um, major advantage of ovarian tissue is that it can be offered to a patient when she is still prepubertal so this is the only possibility we have for very young patients and for all the patients but having to undergo immediate chemotherapy so for those who do not have these two weeks needed for the ovarian stimulation So speaking about cryopreservation of ovarian tissue, we will first see how to cryopreserve and then we will see the results of the transplantation. What shall we cryopreserve? You recognize here a human ovary. What is interesting to cryopreserve is the primordial follicle reserve that you recognize here with these very little white dots here. When you see here these antral follicles, these are not suitable for slow freezing procedure as they will probably not survive the slow freezing procedure. So we aim to freeze only the cortex of the ovary. And this is what it gives after laparoscopic removal of a biopsy. I will take the opportunity to present you the little film on how to perform these ovarian biopsies always by laparoscopy it is considered an emergency procedure so when you see your patient on a monday you can try to arrange to have a place in the surgery room on the tuesday patients will recover very well from that procedure you see that with the scissors we try to really take only the cortex and if you pay attention to really take only the cortex you do not need to dig inside the medulla and you are not provoking bleeding so here you see the thin layer of cortex we will have a histological view some a bit later on As you see, it is not really time consuming. You can do one side or both sides, depending on the risk of premature violent failure the patient is presenting. Of course, this is an adult patient. You recognize the size of the ovary. And there it goes to the lab for, for freezing. Of course, you, you check before leaving the hemostasis and there is no, no really active bleeding. So maybe just a little, little place uh, down one second bipolar, not more, in order not to um, damage the vascularization of the remaining ovary, of course. So, as I said, at histology, you recognize a little piece of tissue and you see that the follicles are located a bit down of the cortex inside the piece we, we took. 
So how does it go? Once you get the biopsy out of the body, you will send it to the laboratory for freezing, and they will, uh, the biologists will prepare some strips, put them in uh, DMSO or another cryoprotectant to freeze. We use the planner machine for the slow freezing procedure, and then it can be put in quarantine and then in the stockage, in the, in the tank, in the bank. So this was good. I told you it was an adult patient. Um, we have, uh, uh, we used to propose also fertility preservation to very young girls, and it is safe, feasible, and efficient for these uh, prepubertal young girls. The youngest patient in our bank has uh, six months uh, of age. Of course, with these very young patients, you cannot do biopsies, and you need to do ophorectomy due to the small size of the ovaries. You see that is the whole ovary. This is our forceps of five millimeters. So uh, prepubertal ovaries are very small. You need to do ophorectomy. Uh, another indication for ophorectomy is patients before bone marrow transplantation, as we know that the, uh, the percentage of uh, ovarian failure is almost 100%. So for these patients also, we do ophorectomy. So going on, the patient is cured and uh, she comes back two to five years later with a pregnancy wish. What uh, can we do for her? Well, we will probably propose orthotopic transplantation. So we will see who is candidate for ovarian tissue transplantation. We will see the techniques and the results of ovarian tissue transplantation. And we will end with a little word on the safety. So about the candidates. First thing, clinical symptoms of premature ovarian failure, like amenorrhea or severe oligospanomenorrhea with high levels of FSH, low levels of AMH. Majority of the patients have uh, zero of AMH with a decrease of iron volume and untrialed follicular count nearly zero. So about the techniques, so you recognize here an atrophic ovary of a menopause patient. Two possibilities. Sorry. So two possibilities. We decorticate, we take away the cortex of uh, that menopausal patient and you replace it by the frozen toad of iron strips. If they are very big, you might will to uh, stitch them Otherwise, you can put them all together and cover them with an interseed. If one ovary is present, you can graft so to the ovarian medulla. This is another example of another patient. So this is the interseed, carefully putting all the little frozen toad pieces of ovary there and covering them with interseed. That is the way we do at the Clinique Saint-Luc. Of course, there are many other ways uh, to perform the surgery. Just to, to show you, uh, this is uh, the Silbers technique, replacing with a big strip of uh, usually fresh uh, human ovarian cortex that you see here with microsurgical techniques. So you see here the technique described by the Israeli team and uh, Merov. So they are making three tunnels with uh, blunt dissection and then passing the frozen tortoise strips into it. And this is the technique, the schematic, uh, the schema uh, presented in the Klaus Andersen's uh, publications. So in Denmark, they do two incisions inside the ovary and they put one by one next to each other the fragments in uh, through these two incisions. Of course, if no ovary is present, well, you have to, to do it another way. And uh, the option is to create a peritoneal window that you see here. The bladder is somewhere here. So it's very easy for IVF to do the oocyte pickup uh, afterwards. You recognize the frozen toad fragments that we do not stitch there, but you cover them with the interseed and then we fix the interseed with some tissue glue all around that we put here all around. 
another example of that uh, little peritoneal window. And you see that in some patients, we could do both graft on the ovary and then also graft on the peritoneal window that you recognize here. Same technique, you put all the fragments and you cover with the interseed. Of course, when you graft orthotopically, you have the possibility of natural conception if uh, the tube is uh, present. Restoration of fertility has been demonstrated for uh, orthotopic sites, being it naturally or by uh, IVF, probably because the pelvic cavity has a favorable environment for the follicular development. I can show you a short video of uh, one of the transplantations we had these last years. So what we do is first fixing the interseed with one or two stitches at the ovary or below, then coming up with this, this spoon forceps in which the fragments are protected. We pay attention to put carefully the fragments in a good way, medulla against medulla, and then we do not stitch the fragments, we cover them with that interseed, just covering the ovary, like this. And then the way to fix the interseed carefully, slowly, is with the tissue glue, where you come here, and there it is. You see that the tube is there, so allowing that patient to have natural pregnancies. Good, so this is a transplantation, but what after that? Of course, what we aim is that the patient is menstruating spontaneously after transplantation, and uh, this works quite well. So you are able to follow FSH values, and of course, estrogen values, and you will see that you can expect the first menstruation, spontaneous menstruation coming from the graft after four months, uh, four months after the grafting procedure. And you see here, this was reported back in 2011, the FSH values, uh, this is a mean of different uh, grafted patients, is going slowly down after three months and four months, you can expect to have the first menstruations back. Good, this is for the menstruation. How long can one graft last? Of course, this is depending on several factors. The first and most important factors, factor being the, old, the age of the patient when she undergoes her ovarian tissue cryopreservation. And this is a case series of five young patients, less than 22 years uh, of age, and when you have young patients, you can expect your graft lasting for around five years. What uh, we do advise is to graft one third of the, of our, the amount of ovarian tissue that was frozen for the patient. And so your patient is still able to undergo a second and eventually a third of ovarian tissue transplantation, making her grafted ovaries functioning for maybe 10 years. But it's good to menstruate, it's good to have estrogen in, in your blood. After all this, of course, the main aim of uh, transplanting of ovarian tissue is to have a baby. So 2004, you recognize the mother of the little Tamara here. Uh, she was cured from Hodgkin lymphoma and, uh, of course, was so happy to have Tamara. But this is back to 2004. And when we see here, more than 15 years after, so Tamara is now 15 years of age. So between the first live birth in our department and the last baby born, how many babies were born worldwide? So let's have a look together. A publication of 2015 reporting 60 live births. Then you see in that publication several teams. Uh, the team of Merov, the team of the Meister, the team of Klaus Andersen in Denmark, the team of Silber, and then you have um, all the other teams having all these babies. You see that 
all the cryopreservation, well, all the babies are born after slow freezing procedure, except in uh, Japan with Kawamura, Kawamura and Suzuki after vitrification. Going on, this is 2017 in the same uh, journal, yeah, 86 successful live births and ongoing pregnancies. So these data are reassuring and they suggest that cryopreservation of ovarian tissue is becoming an established fertility preservation method. So we go on in that uh, article, you see that uh, the teams here, you see Ferti Protect Network, everybody is having babies, pregnancies, uh, healthy life births, which is really nice to see. And this is end of 2017, in which we state 150 live births. And so if you put all these publications on a graph, you see that it is really an exponential increase in the number of worldwide live births after uh, um, transplantation of free, frozen ovarian tissue. So more than 130 live births all by uh, slow freezing, all but two that we have seen by vitrification in Japan. And uh, ovarian medulla and peritoneal window gives equal chance uh, to pregnancy. Uh, of course, if you do peritoneal window and there, is, uh, uh, there are no tubes, the patient will have to undergo IVF, but uh, her chances to have a baby are really uh, realistic. And then, we are thinking for these cancer patients, we want to improve the results in terms of live birth. And maybe we can think that a combined technique could improve these results. And why not performing both? If you have time, of course, to, uh, if the patient has time to undergo the stimulation, she can imagine to have first the, the prior preservation of her ovarian tissue, and then going straight on with the stimulation that you can maybe already start the day before the surgery, which is not a problem. And you can combine to freeze end of end tissue and uh, vitrify mature oocytes. And uh, we could show in that paper of 2014, published in Journal of Ovarian Research, that ovarian tissue cryopreservation followed by stimulation and pickup of mature oocytes does not impair the number or the quality of the retrieved oocyte. So it's good to speak about the number of live births, but this is an absolute number. What we really want to see is in fact the success rate of that technique. And the success rate has always a numerator and a denominator. So we could take as the numerator the number of live births, uh, or better, the patient who had a baby after ovarian tissue transplantation, but then we need as a denominator the patients who had reimplantation. And we don't know how many cases of reimplantations were carried out throughout the world. So to have an insight on that success rate, these five teams went together and put on the table all the results they had. So Brussels, uh, Denmark with Klaus Andersen, the Spanish team with Pelisse, then we have uh, Dietrich's uh, team representing Ferti Protect and Rosen from Australia. And all uh, these teams had 111 transplanted women. Then analyzing the percentage of women who conceived, you see that the number is 29%. Sorry. So in that series of 111 cases, the pregnancy rate was 29% and the live birth rate was 23%. So this was back eh, when I showed you the publication 2015. We tried to improve and in 2019, in our team, the denominator of in a series of 24 cases, well, the live birth rate per patient was 41%, which means that when you have a patient that is undergoing ovarian tissue transplantation, you can tell her that she will have 40% chance to have a baby at home. 
And last but not least, you see here a paper that uh, is accepted very recently in fertility sterility by uh, the team of Merov, uh, the Brussels uh, team of uh, Denis and myself, and Silber team from St. Louis. And you, see, you will be able to read in that paper the number of eligible auto transplantations, so to calculate the success rate in uh, Tel Aviv, in Brussels, and in St. Louis. And in total, we have uh, 60 patients who had auto transplantation. And when we analyze the results of pregnancy after auto transplantation in these patients, you can see that the patients that will have at least one pregnancy is 50%. So 30 out of these 60 patients had at least one baby. Uh, I'm sorry, 41% of these patients had at least one baby and one out of two was pregnant. So pregnancy rate 50%, live birth rate 41%. So as it was said in 2015, in fertility sterility, ovarian cortex transplantation, it is time to move on from experimental studies to open clinical application. And we were all very happy that the same journal in 2019 published the practice committee of the ASRM with the title Fertility Preservation in Patients Undergoing Gonadotoxic Therapy or gonadectomy, a committee opinion, and ovarian tissue cryopreservation is not considered experimental anymore. To end the presentation, I will state a short word about the safety of the procedure. And so we know that it can be potentially unsafe for patients with acute leukemia. And uh, in the paper of infertility sterility, you can see that table. And so there is indeed a group with a high risk of ovarian involvement. Uh, and in that group, you, uh, you recognize leukemia, neuroblastoma, and Burkitt lymphoma. Then you have the moderate risk group where you recognize advanced breast uh, cancer, uh, adenocarcinoma of the cervix, sometimes not non-Hodgkin lymphoma and Ewing sarcoma. All the other pathologies are considered at a low risk. So um, the message today with uh, that slide is to state that before performing ovarian tissue transplantation, we advise to tow one piece of ovarian tissue to analyze his, by histology, by immunohistochemistry, and by molecular uh, biology techniques that uh, at least that piece of ovarian tissue is safe to transplant. If you have any doubt, uh, xenografting to skid mice is also uh, recommended. So ending with a little word of the future, so for patients where there might be a risk of transplanting uh, malignant cells, you know that there is still the option of isolating the follicles and go for in vitro maturation, which is uh, a big research topic of uh, Enable team with Evelyn Telfer, for instance. And uh, you know that our team is working hard on the artificial ovary option. And so the idea is to isolate these uh, human primordial follicles being uh, of the size of 35, 40 microns, and then uh, trying to transplant them in a matrix. Here you see the results with fibrin. These are mice uh, follicles we published with human follicles. And the aim of all this is to, to use an artificial ovary, as it is said here down. So the idea is to isolate the follicles, put them in a matrix, eventually with freshly isolated stroma cells, and that is what we call the transplantable artificial ovary that would be uh, transplanted back to the patient after her cancer treatment. So ending by uh, this future research, I really want to convince you and to motivate you because uh, we are keen to see you back in, uh, at the ISFP Congress so we had a great Congress in New York uh, last uh, year, in 2019. The next Congress will be in 2021. 
This is a save the date, November 18 to 20. It will be in Brussels and I will be really delighted with all the board members of the ISFP uh, to see you there. I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Professor Dorman. You know, it really is a very, very good lecture that involves all the data that we need to know and it's very, very practical and it's perfect for a webinar like this because I think it's very clearly put and everyone can learn. They're very practical and can go from your presentation to actual practice of uh, fertility preservation. Now, there may be some quest uh, questions and answers and I think, you know, we may be open to a few. Um, let me see whether we can get the questions available. If not, while we're waiting, let me start from asking you a couple things. You know, and and this is, um, I think it's very important to identify uh, certain tumors that are more amendable for the preservation and certain cancers that we may unfortunately almost like need to avoid uh, pres uh, preservation, isn't it? Indeed, our team is working quite hard on that. And we published uh, publications about uh, leukemia, um, about um, borderline ovarian tumors, about breast cancer, about sarcomas. And now uh, we have a PhD student, uh, Dr. Tu Nguyen. She's working on neuroblastoma and uh, all the central nervous system uh, tumors. As you have seen, they are in uh, quite high risk, well, uh, empirically. So now we are analyzing all this tissue from uh, neuroblastoma patient, medulloblastoma patient, and so on, to see, uh, to check the safety. So we are looking for molecular markers, depending on each disease, which is quite time consuming. It's really a tailored made approach. And then we are performing uh, xenografting for six months to, to have that long-term uh, potential of uh, the tissue to be really sure of that safety. So I hope that uh, we will be able soon to publish these results. Well, thank you. There's a, a question from the audience. And uh, the question is, um, they ask Professor Dorman, would there be an age limit in pres uh, fertility preservation? Okay, very good question indeed. Well, you have seen the results that were published by Anacobo for oocyte vitrification, and you have seen the age limit, which is less than 35 and more than 36. So really in our department, we used to have that upper limit of 35 years of age. The aim is uh, thinking that you want to preserve a certain amount of uh, primordial follicle pools, and if the patient is older, well, you might give her false hope that she has some uh, good quality of her tissue there, cryopreserved, and finally not. But uh, from um, a legal point of view, uh, it is ad ad admittable to cryopreserve until the age of 38. So that is for the reimbursement criteria in Belgium. Okay, now following that, is there any difference in the techniques of fertility preservation that may vary with age? No. It, well, I would say no if uh, the patient is postpubertal, but as I showed you, for prepubertal patient, uh, you have no choice in the technique. You need to perform an ovariectomy. And for all the patients postpubertal, when they have not a 100% chance of POF, well, you can propose instead of the ovarectomy to do only the biopsies. But we always do it by laparoscopy. Thank you. Now, one more thing. Um, as you know, um, slow freezing, you know, it has is the uh, technique that we have been using and proven to be very useful. But, on, but it's uh, a more, let's say, expensive uh, way because uh, nowadays, and also uh, a lot of uh, embryologists are more, how should I say it? Uh, they prefer vitrification 
Now, I know the number of live births, you know, is of course because of history, it's a lot of slow freezing. And now yeah. Suzuki, you have only been doing it for what, uh, I, now it's been uh, for maybe eight years. And so the collection of patients are small. Well, of I'm course. Sure, uh, yeah, so <laughs> what's your comment? Okay, of course, we, we need to wait some years that these patients of uh, Nao Suzuki are coming back to get the, the vitrified tissue transplanted. Um, well, so far, the gold standard for uh, vein tissue freezing is slow freezing. As you said, because all the almost all the babies are born with this technique, and we published last year in Human Reproduction, uh, it was quite a lot of work uh, on baboon vein tissue that we vitrified uh, to have a primate uh, non-human model and i have to tell you that all these baboons were recovering menses and uh, estradiol values that were high and cyclic so uh, ovule well the hormonal function was preserved after after vitrification but none of these baboons uh, after mating became pregnant so we still have a doubt that vitrification is better than slow freezing after all these experimental studies we performed uh, with our laboratory. So then for the rest, I'm waiting for the Japanese results, of course. <laughs> and just to say, I am not sure that vitrifying is so, uh, is really less expensive than slow freezing. Because if you have a whole ovary that you need to vitrify, I can tell you that you need at least two or three biologists being there busy for hours and hours and trying to vitrify because it's one by one all these uh, pieces of uh, strips of ovarian cortex so if you have the machine the planner you can put all your samples together in the machine you switch it on and you go away so the problem is that nowadays laboratories they get rid of their machines a few years ago so they don't have it anymore <laughs> That is, okay. uh, that is the reason I brought this up because you know, uh, as you know, a lot of students really didn't get all the questions. But with a point, I think uh, we have to be careful you know, about this to see it to work, but we have to see it to, uh, to see the proof. Indeed. Last, lastly, you know, about social housing. Uh, as you know, you know, this is a uh, a topic and as a man i must say this is you know a, a excellent way because it provides ladies females you know with a choice you know to choose their own destiny in fertility you know mm -hmm. when they want it when they want, don't want it and also uh, because nowadays you know there's it may extend to also they can choose to undergo an immediate uh, menopause or they can extend it and not spending half of the life in menopause but maybe only a quarter of the life in menopause I support it completely but let me ask you this for a normal usual fertility preservation okay like as we see it now would you still recommend ovarian freezing or would you recommend Oocyte freezing. And let's well, say you know women with uh, women say uh, women of say thirty to thirty four that we recommend you know that uh, you know. Okay, both both techniques have uh, given proof of uh, possibility of live birth. The the thing is that usually you don't have so much choice. It's depending on the indication. If you have a breast cancer. Uh, usually, you have time for these two weeks of uh, of end stimulation between the surgery and the onset of chemotherapy. So these patients can undergo uh, all side vitrification without any problem. Uh, the other thing is that if you have uh, um, leukemia or patient who need to undergo immediate chemotherapy, you don't have the choice. You cannot uh, uh, allow yourself as a doctor to to delay the onset of chemo by two weeks. So you need to do ovarian tissue. So I think it's really case by case and pathology dependent. 
That's wonderful. You know, again, I would like to thank Professor Dormans for a wonderful lecture. I think it's, I learned so much from this. And mm. uh, I've always been a, a fan of uh, fertility preservation. As you know, as I was one of the original member of the society. And I'm very glad to welcome you to be the next president. And I will see you in Belgium, definitely in November. Uh, well, let's hope everything is over in this world by that time. And we can uh, hope. Huh? So, yes. So um, one la at the last time, you know, one last comment from me is: let us thank Professor Doma in our usual manner. <laughs> thank you all. It was my pleasure, and I hope to see you soon. Stay safe. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. And yes. Please say stay safe. Social distance, stay safe, wear masks. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everybody.